Hi everyone, thank you for joining me today. My name is Patrick Brown. Uh, I'm from Thermo Fisher Scientific, and I'm the product manager for the Nanodrop line of microvolume DVBiz spectrophotometers. Today, I want to show you how we can differentiate DNA from RNA using our Nanodrop 1 spectrophotometer. Now, traditionally, it's been very difficult to differentiate DNA from RNA in a typical UV-Vis measurement. And that's because the absorbance spectra of DNA and RNA look very similar, almost identical. So if we think about the, the problem that we're facing, let's start out by reminding ourselves how a UV-Vis absorbance measurement is made. So we always start with a light source. And that light source shines light through the blank. And then the light going through the blank or the reference is read on the detector. Next, we read the light that is able to go through the sample, and that's measured on the detector. And then the light that was transmitted through the measurements through the sample is compared to the reference or the blank. And the light that's missing from the sample is referred to as absorbance. And you can see from this type of hardware that a UV-Vis measurement is nonspecific it will measure the absorbance of whatever is in the sample. And so when we want to use UV-Vis absorbance in order to calculate DNA or RNA or protein concentrations, it's really up to the researcher, it's really up to the end user in order to make sure that molecule is, uh, is pure, that sample only contains pure molecules. One of the things that we've identified is, is difficult for scientists and our researchers is differentiating between DNA and RNA. Like I mentioned, and as you see here in this graph, DNA and RNA look nearly identical. Typically, we use the absorbance at 260 nanometers to calculate DNA and RNA concentrations by taking that absorbance at 260 nanometers and applying the Beer-Lambert equation. Now, what that does is it really just focuses on a single wavelength. And so all the other data around it, all the other wavelengths uh, don't matter really when calculating the concentration. So why is DNA and RNA in the same sample really a problem? Well, when we think about what we're doing downstream of measuring concentration, we think of techniques like cloning, maybe next generation sequencing, maybe qPCR. And all of these techniques require a particular amount of starting material, a particular amount of starting DNA, or a particular amount of starting RNA. So imagine, if you will, that your technique, your application requires 50 nanograms of starting material, let's say 50 nanograms of DNA. You measure your sample and unknowing, unknowingly, you have RNA contamination in your DNA. Well, right, ahead, right there, you have um, data that is falsely elevated. Because you don't know you have RNA contamination, and it's very difficult to see this type of contamination by eye, you are then taking that concentration value as truly just DNA, 100% DNA, when in fact it's partly RNA. So when then you go ahead and make dilutions or take a volume of your sample and go into that next step, you're not just using DNA, but you're also putting in RNA. So where you may need 50 nanograms of DNA, maybe you're only putting in 30 nanograms of DNA. And this can cause your downstream reaction to fail or, or not go as planned. Looking at literature, there are a number of techniques, a number of papers talking about how to identify DNA contamination in RNA and vice versa. And when you find that contamination, what kind of applications, what kind of techniques can you do to clean up your sample? And so what we decided here is that we know that this is a problem facing scientists around the world and in multiple segments. So we took the approach of trying to identify how we can differentiate DNA from RNA using a quick UV-Vis measurement in the same sample. 
the approach that we took uh, allows us to differentiate DNA from RNA using multiple wavelengths. Like I mentioned before, typically we quantify nucleic acid using that peak right around 260 nanometers. However, when there are two molecules in the sample that absorb light, it's difficult to just use a single point. In this case, we can use a technique called chemometrics. This is really just a mathematical model that, that makes predictions on sample concentration of multiple components within the same sample spectrum. And it does so using multiple wavelengths, not just a single wavelength. And so what we can do is we can use more information in the sample spectrum to identify different components within that same sample. What we see here is mammalian DNA represented in blue and an absorbent spectrum of mammalian RNA in red. And there are just a couple of areas where the two spectra are different. So firstly, there's a, a small difference right around 230, 235 nanometers. And then there's a larger difference from 270 to about 290 nanometers. And this is where we can train mathematical algorithms to differentiate between the two. So what, chemometric, what chemometrics allows us to do is to build up a library, build up a training set. So what we've done is built up a library measuring known concentrations of pure DNA, known concentrations of pure RNA, and then known concentrations of mixtures of DNA and RNA. We take all of these spectra, feed it into uh, our chemometrics software, and we can build a predictive model, predictive mathematical model, such that when you feed in a sample spectrum, the mathematical model looks at it, and it can detect based on the absorbance spectrum shape in a small region, whether you have DNA, RNA, or some combination of both. And we do have an application note that talks through how we did this and provides some data to show you the efficacy of these models. And I'll briefly walk you through one of the figures uh, from that paper. Looking in literature, what we find is that fluorescence is frequently used to specifically, or at least selectively, measure DNA in the presence of contaminant or RNA in the presence of a contaminant. So what we're doing here is comparing our predictive algorithms to a fluorescence baseline standard here. On the x-axis are different mixtures. Uh, so we have different mixtures of DNA and RNA, right? So mixture one, uh, I believe that's 70 and, and about 30, and then down to, to uh, mixture um, seven and eight, they have different concentrations uh, different relative concentrations of DNA and RNA. On the y-axis, we're just looking at DNA concentration or DNA predicted concentration, but the same holds true for our RNA predictions. To orient, to orient each other with the colors here, the blue bar is the concentration that was detected without any correction. Uh, so this would be a traditional measurement if you're just applying the Beer-Lambert equation no correction. The red bar indicates what the theoretical DNA concentration should be based on what our application scientists created in the lab. The green bar indicates the algorithm corrected concentration. You'll see here this word Eclero. That's what we call our software. But again, this is just the algorithm predicted concentration. And then purple is the fluorescence model. So we've taken these same samples, used a fluorescence assay, which will selectively just measure the DNA concentration. And what we see is that green, which again is our algorithm predicted model, that concentration is very close to the red theoretical concentration. That the, the accuracy is, is very good. In many cases, it's, it's within 10%. Comparatively, when we look at the fluorescence data, it's also pretty close. And uh, so what we can say here is that our predictive models are very accurate at determining 
DNA concentration in the presence of RNA or the reverse. Uh, we have data also for RNA concentrations uh, in the presence of a DNA contaminant. Now, I did mention before that the graph was with uh, mammalian uh, DNA, mammalian RNA. In order to differentiate between DNA and RNA, we do require, the algorithms require knowing the species because there's greatest difference within the same species and the differences are smaller and harder to detect between, between species. But within a single species, we can easily and reliably and accurately detect DNA contamination in RNA and RNA contamination in DNA. I do want to thank you for your time. Uh, really, the goal here is that users can confidently use the correct amount of nucleic acid in their sample. If we go back to that previous example, when you were um, you know, using potentially the wrong amount of nucleic acid, you can have a failed experiment, which requires you to go back and, uh, and really just troubleshoot. But we want to resolve that issue for, for everyone out there. Thanks for your attention today. Uh, if you want, you can learn more at thermofisher.com forward slash nanodropquant. If you're located in the UK or in Ireland, please visit the lab tech area and, we can, and you can ask questions and learn more about this new technology. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that may have popped up. Uh, so the question is, is this software something we can download? Absolutely. This software is available as a free update for all Nanodrop One instruments, regardless of when you purchased the instrument, uh, if you purchased it last year or three years ago. You can go to our website and you can learn more at that, that link down there. You can purchase, uh, excuse me, you can go to that website and download the software for free, upload it onto your instrument, and you'll have our new algorithms uh, at your fingertips.